little bit? Okay, so here's an example. I sometimes ask the question, this is gonna ruin it. Now I can never ask this question because all these thousand people are gonna know. But anyway, I sometimes ask the question, what's your Achilles heel? And a lot of pretty sophisticated medical school applicants will quick do some thinking in their subconscious and be like, ah, this is the time for me to talk about my weakness. I have prepared this. And then they give me some super annoying non-weakness, weakness like, well, I tend to take on too much responsibility or like, oh, sometimes mm -hmm. I'm kind of a perfectionist. It's sometimes to say, no, I'm sorry, I reject that answer. It's, it's too boring and it sounds like what everyone says. And so for the next hour, we're gonna be joined by three incredible, incredible admissions experts. We're gonna introduce themselves. They're gonna log on right around now. There's Mr. Doug Taylor from East Tennessee State University as medical school. There's Dr. Catherine Robinette from the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And we're gonna be having one additional Dean joined from Boston University, who just may be a few minutes late. Um, remember, please ask your questions in the Q&A directly, and we're going to try to get through as many, as many questions as possible for you all. Um, this is all live, and remember, any questions in the Q&A that we don't get to today, you'll get emails sent to you afterwards with answers directly from physicians. Um, and again, you don't have to worry about taking notes or recording anything. This will all be pre-recorded for you. Um, but then why don't we go ahead and get started with introductions for two of our incredible, incredible deans who are taking the time out of their Saturday to join. So let's get started with Dr. Catherine Robinette from the University of Maryland. Dr. Robinette, can you introduce yourself? There's no way that I could do as good of a job as you can about telling your story, where you're from and how you got into medical admissions. And then we're gonna move on to Dr. Taylor and then we'll get to the Q&A. Excellent, hi, yes, I'm Catherine Robinette. I'm the Assistant Dean for Admissions at University of Maryland School of Medicine. Um, I'm actually an 04 alum and uh, got involved when I was a medical student way back in 02. I can't say that I predicted this is where I would end up, but it's something that I'm really passionate about. I think it is very hard to pick who I want to be, who I, not just me personally, but who will be great providers, who you know will be good colleagues, good providers for my family and my loved ones. And that certainly doesn't just depend on numbers. So I was kind of like grabbed at that from the beginning when I was a medical student and got involved as a faculty member as well. I am a pulmonary critical care physician. So I did four years of medical school at Maryland and then another three years of internal medicine residency at University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, then back for another four years of fellowship at University of Maryland. So um, that now I've been on faculty since 2011 and in this role since 2019, I'm just very much enjoying it. Thank you so much again for joining us, Dr. Robinette, and I'm sure that you have so much valuable wisdom to share. And our next dean to introduce is Mr. Doug Taylor from East Tennessee State University. Mr. Taylor, please. Greetings, one and all. Uh, my name is Doug Taylor. I'm fluent in two languages. I speak a little English and mostly Southern Appalachian. Uh, if you have any trouble understanding, we'll be glad to clarify. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of uh, coming into the medical admissions business. I'm currently the associate dean for admissions at our medical school in East Tennessee. Uh, I came into this business about 46 years ago and have had the great pleasure of uh, working with young people and helping them achieve their green dreams over, uh, over all these years. And that's uh, one of the greatest things you could do. And like Dr. Robinette, uh, I've been right here in East Tennessee and I don't tend to go anywhere else. I don't see any need to. This is a great place. And um, it's a pleasure to be here with you and hope we can offer you some uh, advice that might help you uh, get where you want to be in your life also. Thank you so much both for joining us. And again, um, Dr. Goodell from Boston University School of Medicine will be joining. She's actually on another panel finishing up as we speak. Um, so this is going to be over the next hour. Questions directly answered um, on sort of live from your questions in the Q&A. So we'll be monitoring those and while one dean is speaking, the other deans may be answering questions directly in the Q&A via typing, so please continue asking them, and we're going to try to get to as many as possible. The first question, though, that I want to get started with overall to both of you, and, and we could start with Mr. Taylor first, then, is when you're looking at an application and you see, you know, a student's application comes in, how do you go about reviewing it? Is there something that you look to first, and then how do you go down the process of overall looking at a student's application when you receive it? 
I think uh, reasonably answering that, I think the first thing we've got to look at is find numbers that are predictive of success uh, in medical school. If those numbers are not there, uh, it's very difficult to uh, overcome anything in, in the future. Once, uh, once those numbers are, are determined, we put them at our school, we put them pretty much out of sight uh, and start looking at the person, try to look at the person's service orientation, their ability to, to work with others, the ability to express himself uh, clearly. We look for teamwork. What we're really looking for someone is uh, after graduation, someone that uh, I would let take care of my wife or my daughter. Uh, that's what we're looking for here. Absolutely. And Dr. Robinette, I'm going to ask you actually the same question, because I think it's a really important one to think about, you know, when you're receiving an application and students put so much effort into really showcasing themselves, how do you go about looking through it? Yeah. So the first thing I will say, if you take nothing else away from me, and I love being here and helping people understand this process, if you are nothing else, apply early. Almost all schools work on rolling admissions. I know we do at Maryland. Our deadline is technically November for the primary and December 1st for the secondary, but we have received these days, applications are numbers are just going up by September. We usually have close to 4,000 applications. So apply early. We only have, but so many interview spots. So I know that's not the exact question you asked me, but that is the one thing I really want people to walk away with. Um, like Mr. Taylor, we don't want to bring anyone on who we don't think is going to be academically successful. So we accept a wide range or wide range of MCATs. I think our range is usually between 500 and 526 when you look at our matriculating class. Um, and typically we want people to have over three, two in their science GPAs. If you had a terrible undergrad record and things were hard for you then and have changed, you can certainly do a post back and we'll just look at those grades um, or a graduate degree that has uh, significant science classes and we'll focus on those grades and not your undergrad grades. But medical school's hard. I'm sure you have all heard some sort of analogy to if drinking, if college is like trying to drink from a garden hose, medical school is like trying to drink from an open fire hydrant. And we don't want to bring people onto campus to potentially take on debt and spend time if they aren't able to pass the USMLE steps and work their way through our curriculum. And so for us, we have we don't have any direct cutoffs, but that's certainly what we look at. Also, like Mr. Taylor said, once you're screened by someone who is an interviewer and also a trained screener. We look at everything, including the numbers. And once we've determined that you are not at academic risk, we look at service, we look at shadowing, which is absolutely essential, and really don't look at your numbers anymore. The interviewers don't have the MCAT score or GPA. Um, the committee member who presents to, to the committee sees the whole picture again, but really, we determine academic capability, and then we're much more interested in what or how you portray your motivation to be a doctor. Because what we have found is the people who often struggle, since we're not bringing in people who are at academic risk, are people who lose motivation, maybe didn't understand what it meant. And you, it, it is a long haul. I think if anyone was adding up numbers, after undergrad, I did another 11 years of training. Like That is a long haul. So just kind of people who have really thought about this have done the work to figure out that they want to be a physician. Um, those are the things we're looking for in an application. Well, fair enough, right? It's a very, very intensive process about getting things done on time and making sure that students can stand out and showcase their experiences. But like you said, there are a lot of people who are applying. So when you're evaluating students, what are the types of things that you look for, Dr. Robinette, that you feel like really helps showcase that somebody is truly passionate about medicine, that they're standing out amongst the thousands of applications that you're receiving. Yeah, I heard the question right at the end while I was trying to get my sound and everything to work about the number of hours. And I think her answer, I think it's Dr. Martinelli's answer was very right. And some the other person said that the numbers, the ranges she gave were about right, but it doesn't matter as much as how you explain things. So what we're looking for is not just someone who has shadowed 100 or 150 hours, but we want to hear what your takeaways were. I will be very honest, like the I didn't consider being a doctor till I was in college. That was kind of the first time none of my family's medical and, and actually an old babysitter of mine is like, oh, you like science? I love being a doctor. She's a pediatric resident. I went and I shadowed her and I hated it. I was like, absolutely not. This is terrible. I do not want to do this. 
And I want that kind of reflect, obviously I shadowed much more after that. I got into research, then I started shadowing people in other clinical settings that I loved, but I want you to take that kind of true curiosity when you shadow um, and when you're doing clinical things, not just, oh, I need to get my hours to shadow, but actually reflect on like, this is what I saw, this is what I witnessed, and this is what I loved about that experience. I did not share in my application that I hated the pediatric emergency room, which I still stand by, but I want you to go in with that personal curiosity. Is this really for me or not? And then talk about those reasons it really is for you. And it doesn't have to be creative writing, but just kind of truly what you witnessed, what it is about the patient-physician relationship that is that you're so passionate about that you want that to be part of your career and your profession. That's a fantastic, uh, fantastic answer and a great point. And Mr. Taylor, we're going to move on to a question directly for you then that I'm seeing several people ask in the chat. And it, and it has to do with something similar to what Dr. Robinet just said about, you know, you might not know that you want to be a physician until later on in life. It could be during college. It could be beyond that. It could be after having a whole separate career outside of medicine. So when you're evaluating a candidate who may not be a traditional student, may not have gone directly from, you know, schooling to college, directly to applying to medical school, how do you evaluate someone's background and the experiences that they've gone through when you're looking at their application, Mr. Taylor? We, we look at people, we, we like to see that you've got some uh, valuable miles in your rearview mirror, uh, that you've experienced uh, life and, and something that... Uh, uh, it's a good thing if you experience failure somewhere along the line, or maybe more than one. It shows resilience uh, because as you go through medical school, you're likely to hit a couple of bumps. Uh, you need to know how to get through them, uh, and you need to know how to ask for help. Um, we look at people who have had these lived experiences um, as, as somebody that's um, really a little more resilient down the line. Uh, and, and more capable of success uh, with less trouble in their life uh, getting through school. We look at people who perhaps, like Doug Taylor, started out slowly in college, uh, majored in campusology for a while, then finally figured things out. Uh, we look at we look at what you can do now. Show show what you're capable of now. Uh, the the past is behind you. You can't change it. Uh, but if you can show your competencies now, I think most medical schools will, will look at that in a, in a favorable light. To, to piggyback off that for you, Mr. Taylor, then what are some of those experiences that you like to see? Are there certain types of individual backgrounds that you feel provide value to show that somebody has those miles that as you were saying? What are some of those kind of life experiences that people uh, might have that you might seem to find favorable. And I know that this answer might vary depending on who we ask. So for you, what do you feel like is something that shows somebody has truly gone through certain experience? Uh, we we very much like people who have uh, served in the military. Uh, we like people who have been uh, active and accomplished in team sports. Uh, we like people uh, who have uh, engaged in things like Teach for America or uh, uh, Peace Corps, th things of that nature. People who have come out of their original culture to some extent, gone to experience different cultures, uh, and have been able to accomplish and achieve in, in those areas also. I love it. And now we are joined by Dr. Goodell um, from Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Goodell, could you please just introduce yourself and then we'll get on. Sure. Um, are there specifications for what I'm supposed to say since I missed the introduction instructions? Anything you'd like about your background, how you got into, you know, the medical school admission space, where you are right now and things like that. Just a brief introduction. Okay, sure. So, uh, right. So my name is uh, Kristen Goodell. I am a family doctor and I am the Associate Dean of Admissions at Boston University Chubanian and Avedisian School of Medicine. My primary job qualification being that I can say Chubanian and Avedisian School of Medicine really fast. Um, I have the uh, unique distinction of having been faculty at all the three medical schools in Boston, um, but I am have been in Boston for my whole career. Um, at BU, in addition to uh, seeing patients and doing admissions, I am also um, what's called an academy medical educator, which means that I teach clinical skills for our students and um, serve as an advisor for students that goes through all four years. 
Okay, awesome. And thank you all three of you again for being here. And we're asking individual questions to individual doctors on the panel uh, and admissions experts. And we also have the Q&A at the bottom that you could all be answering questions to as we speak as well. But a quick question directly then to get started with you, Dr. Goodell. I asked um, you know, our other two panelists already, but when you're looking at an applicant who has sent you an application, who's worked hard to have a lot of different experiences and put together an application, what is your process of going through and sort of seeing if they'd be a great fit at your medical school and if you're going to grant the person an interview? Oh, that's a great question. So um, we have a, a, I mean, you know this, all the medical schools are a little different. What we do, uh, we get about, well, last year we got 10,700 AMCAS applications. Um, so that's a lot. Um, <laughs> we have an initial review process where um, we have a team of reviewers, which I'm, I'm trying to increase the size of it so we have more people. But um, so we have about a dozen, 15 reviewers. We use a rubric um, and we evaluate each application according to the rubric. So there are specific things that we look at using our rubric that include things like academic promise, uh, clinical experience, um, resilience kind of as demonstrated by having overcome obstacles, your uh, potential to bring a new and different perspective to the class. So we look at a set of things and every each of the reviewers basically gets a giant stack of applications and they apply the rubric to the applications. They give it a score, they give it comments. Um, and then from that, we take the, the top batch of those from each reviewer. And, um, and those are the people that we invite for an interview. Wow. Yeah. So that's quite the process, right? There's so many, there are so many steps and individuals who go into the process of accepting somebody into medical school. And so when a student is interested in becoming a pre-med and then eventually applying to medical school, they might think, okay, well, what major should I do in college? What type of background should I do? And, and Dr. Robinette, I'm going to ask you about majors and sort of, are there certain uh, backgrounds in terms of educational backgrounds that you look for for individuals? For example, is a science-related degree important or is any degree valuable? Where would you go for, for that? Yeah, it's so interesting. I feel like it's evolved over the year. I was told back in the 90s, if I want to get into medical school, I should be an art history major. It's like, I'm not going to do well in art history. So I just did chemistry because that's what I can do. Um, so I would say choose something that you enjoy. College is definitely a time to explore and get all kinds of fascinating classes. Um, and we don't care what you major in. You need to do the prereqs. We have some basic prereqs that you can see on our website. We also recommend strongly biochemistry and immunology. So certainly you're going to have some medical, uh, or I'm sorry, some science prereqs for those courses, but it really doesn't make any difference to us what you major in. And as far as educational background, I think at least at Maryland, we really don't look at, um, what is maybe negatively called a pedigree of any sort. We probably 10% of our class did two years at community colleges. We, um, we recognize the finances of undergraduate degrees are incredibly difficult these days. So, um, you know, we, we take people from all different backgrounds. Um, again, really just emphasizing or trying to see it as a binary. Will this person be at an academic risk or not? Um, and as long as you have a solid science GPA and solid MCAT, then that kind of checks that box. And it doesn't matter where you went to undergrad or what your degree was in. Perfect. And thank you again to the deans for answering the questions in the Q&A. Guys, keep asking your questions away. We'll try to get through as many as possible. And the next question is going to be for Mr. Taylor, because I've seen it a lot in the chat. And it's about uh, sort of clinical experiences or ways to get yourself exposed to the world of medicine. And, you know, what type of experiences have you seen students apply to in terms of seeing what a doctor does on a daily basis and really kind of knowing hey, like I've talked to patients in the past. I sort of know what this whole field is that I'm getting myself into. What types of experiences have you seen from people and how is the importance of it to you? I would have to say we, we've seen just about anything that's out there uh, one way or another at one time or another. Uh, we, we think the most valuable uh, experiences are those that are valuable to the applicant. Um, there are these things, we, we call them box checkers and and for God's sakes, don't be a box checker. Don't do it just because you think you've got to do it. Uh, do it because it's 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 fanning your flames, it's building your fire, showing you that this is the right career for you. This is what you've got to do in your life because it's hard. Uh, 
the, the second question we always ask uh, of ourselves when we're evaluating applications is, will this person do it? And that's every bit as uh, as important a question as, as can this person do it from the academic side. You've got to have that um, you've got to have that push that background. It's got to be internal. Uh, I can pretty well assure you that grandma's motivation won't get you through it. Uh, it's just too hard. Uh, but you any of these things we like to see people that have maybe seen a little of the downside of medicine. It's good to know that. Uh, not everyone uh, gets well and goes home uh, have, happy uh, from the hospital. Uh, so the same doctor that brings really good news to one family has to bring really bad news to the next one. Can you do that? Is that is that something you could do in your life? Uh, because you will have likely have to do both at some time or another. So what we look for uh, is, is a person that's not the quantity of the experiences you get. It's the quality. And the quality is totally what it did for you how did how did it how did it inspire you how does it send you on down this trail of, of a career in medicine definitely thank you so much for that answer mr Taylor. and i'm going to piggyback off it for you dr goodell because you know those types of experiences that a physician has can be very difficult delivering good news bad news and really having seen a lot of different ups and downs in the medical field so when you're looking at and a candidate, whether it's during the evaluation process or even during the interview and trying to really connect and understand the individual, how can you get a good sense of somebody's sort of maturity level or understanding of those ups and downs and how they've gone through the process? Oh, well, that's probably the hardest part of our job, actually, because honestly, most of the people that make it to the interview stage are, um, I don't know, like competent and pretty polished. And I think people know what to, I think a lot of people have a sense of like what the good, what the right thing is that they're supposed to say. And so um, I am always trying to, in the interview, ask questions that really um, get at who the person is. And so, I mean, one thing that we do sometimes is I will, um, I have been known to uh, get pushed back on people's answers a little bit. Okay, so here's an example. I sometimes ask the question, this is gonna ruin it now, I can never ask this question because all these thousand people are gonna know. Anyway, I sometimes ask the question, what's your Achilles heel? And a lot of pretty sophisticated medical school applicants will quick do some thinking in their subconscious and be like, ah, this is a time for me to talk about my weakness. I have prepared this. And then they give me some super annoying non-weakness, weakness like, well, I tend to take on too much responsibility or like, oh, sometimes mm -hmm. I'm kind of a perfectionist. Anyway, so my response to that is sometimes to say, no, I'm sorry, I reject that answer. It's, it's too boring and it sounds like what everyone says and it's too good. What I really wanna know is, what is something that might not even really be a weakness, but just keeps coming up and causing you to stumble like over and over again. That's what I want to know. Something that actually has caused you a problem, you know, weakness or not. Um, and what I am really looking for there is not, I'm not, I don't really care what the person says, their weakness is. It would have to be egregious for me to like really think it was a problem. What I really am looking for is how do they respond to my feedback? Like when I say, nah, not good enough, do they like freak out, get nervous? Do they get mad at me? Do they get defensive? Or are they able to say, okay, I see what you mean. All right, let me think about this. And then they tell me like, okay, well, honestly, uh, you know, I had somebody ask this question the other day and I had somebody said, it's asking questions. I really need to get better at asking questions in class. I'm kind of afraid to do it. I'm always afraid I'm gonna look dumb. And honestly, right now I'm in trouble because of this, because I didn't actually ask about the requirements for this project. And now it's due and I have to ask a friend and hope they're right. And I was like, okay, that was legit. But really what I was looking for is I just wanted to know that somebody would like responded to me. That's a marker of maturity. And it's a marker of kind of being able to take a little, you know, it's, a, it's like a communication skill. So I guess a lot of that, a lot of that comes out in the interview. Um, you know, we also look for that sort of thing in, in the letters of recommendation. Um, although that's tough because letters of recommendation just emphasize the good things and they don't tell us the less good things. So <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And that's such a good point. I remember honestly, when I was interviewing for medical school, 
Uh, uh, that happened to me as well. I think my interviewer asked what was a challenge that you went through and I gave some answer about some class and, and I think he said, you know, that is a notoriously bad answer and he gave me a chance to give another answer. So it's definitely something that happens, but you could overcome a bad answer. So, um, so Dr. Robinet, then, you know, we, we were talking a lot about the interview process, right? And so when somebody gets an interview from your medical school and you're saying, okay, you know, we're going to interview this person. Now you have to decide whether or not to accept that person. So what is it about the interview, you know, that really can make or break a student's application? What really can push somebody over the edge of being somebody who just interviews to somebody who you say, we have to have that person in our incoming class? Yeah. So first of all, I'm stealing your question, Dr. Goodell. I think that's great. I love it. Um, I will say that our statistics, if you interview, are very good. So we get about 6,000 applications. We interview about 600 and we accept about 300. So if you actually interview with us, I think, you know, that's a 50-50 accept. And then we might take more off the wait list. Um, so the stats go up significantly as far as getting in. I think the difference, what we're looking for in an interview is applications can be so polished. Like Dr. Goodell said, like not only do applicants are very competent and they know what to say on an interview, but even more so, I think some applications are heavily edited by people's pre-health, um, maybe chat GPT, although you're not supposed to on your AMCAS, like there's plenty of ways you can, we know you can pay to get a personal statement written for you. Um, so I, what we want and what we ask, we don't do MMI or anything like that, are those questions like Dr. Goodell said. I frequently ask people um, about, first of all, know everything on your application. And that can be hard. That seems silly, but you do your application in May and sometimes you're interviewing in January. So make sure you read through your whole thing and you can answer questions about each of the activities. And then I always because I think motivation is what I see as the biggest predictor of success, ask about like in your shadowing experience, what is a patient physician interaction that you really want to make sure you model when you're a physician? Um, and if it's exactly, sometimes I will get almost word for word what they wrote on our secondary when we asked about the most cl important clinical experience. I'm like, okay, yep, I read about that one. Like, how about another one? And I just want to hear that spontaneously from them, they can convey the same level of motivation and same passion, same interest. And I know Mr. Taylor said this. I feel like it also came up in the last time. This is why you should do activities you love. I want to see enthusiasm. Like, you can talk to me about like, women's sanitary products for menstruation or, you know, work with people for clean water or like, it doesn't have to be medical, but I just want to see people who have spent time doing things that they're excited about, like playing sports. Like that is, you know, if it, being part of a team, talk to me about what that was like, what was it like in the locker room when things are hard, um, kind of getting at that resilience. So we're really just asking about your application and making sure, you know, doing our best to make sure that you um, are as motivated and as engaged as your application seemed. That's awesome. Yeah, great, great answer as well. And Mr. Taylor, I'm going to ask you a similar thing. But before I do, remember, we have 440 questions so far in that Q&A. We're going to try to get through as many as possible. But I think that this is so valuable to ask because Again, we're not asking you to share the, all of the questions that you ask in an interview of a student typically, but what are some of those types of things that really help distinguish somebody when you're talking to them that you can get a sense that, you know, this person's really going to be an excellent physician. They're somebody we want in our medical school class. Yeah, we're we're really very laid back in our, in our interviewing process. Uh, we do uh, one uh, little standardized interview of about five different questions. Uh, that we do actually score on a rubric and we tell our committee start in the middle this person is average but their answers either move you up or down from average in that and the second one is totally an unstructured interview where we just talk about the person and you you know you can you can pretty much tell a lot of the time when when there's real passion and real what we call fire in the belly uh to to do the uh, to do to do medicine but but basically, and I think that both of my colleagues here have, have very well hit this. Uh, these people are polished. They they know what this is about. And they they know what they're supposed to be doing. They know what they're supposed to look like on this. And really, the most I guess I think really probably the most important thing about the interview is that it on occasion lets you pick out the person with the third eye, the the person that that just really doesn't fit, that doesn't work for you. Uh, that really, you know, you wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to let them work on you with a vaccinated crowbar. 
uh, you just uh, want, to, want to stay away from that person. The rest of the people are going to be pretty well, but every once in a while, uh, you get that person whose enthusiasm and and not over the top, but but well rooted, well well experienced. This is what they've got to do in their life. They know that's what they've got to do in their life. They're really passionate about uh, going into the profession. I love it. I love it. And so um, a question that I keep seeing in the Q&A is about research. Dr. Robinette, I want to ask you a little bit about the importance of that. Is research in some form, in some capacity, a must? Is it how important is it? How much do you value research experience in somebody who's applying to medical school? Because maybe that person isn't fully re interested in research or in a career that involves that. So when it comes to research and you're evaluating and evaluating an application, you know, what emphasis do you place on it? What would you tell somebody who's sort of a pre-med and, and thinking, do I need to do research? Do I need to check this box? What do I do? Yeah. Anyone who's a pre-med, I recommend do research. This was a question that I saw too, that I recommend you do research outside of your classes. That be, like not just your organic chemistry lab, but actually go and volunteer and work in a lab. Um, it can be for one of your professors or somewhere else during the summer. We do not require research. So we accept people every year who have no research at all for our MD only program. We do have a robust MD, PhD, and MD master's programs, which of course do require research. But you know, I've been on enough of these panels to know that Ohio State and Hopkins and there are plenty of great medical schools out there do require research. So whenever I am giving advice, I say just make sure you get some research experience. The, we like seeing it. So that's like one of the activities that we see that I'm interested in. So, uh, you know, to, we don't compare one applicant to another, but we want to hear what was your experience like. I mean, I have laughed out loud when some people are like, I tried to do research and none of it worked. So the lessons I took away <laughs> were <laughs> persistence or that this is not what I want to do for a career. Like, so, I mean, there are certainly lessons to be taken away. I think it can fit into the whole picture of what you want your career to look like. And it just shows that you are serious about maybe having considered basic science and decided it wasn't for you or wanting research to be an integral part of your career as a physician. So make it part of your story. We certainly you know, like reading about it, like to see what people's impressions were, what their takeaways were, um, but it is not required for our MD only program. And we accept people every year that have zero research. Awesome. Yeah, understood. And some people too, like research doesn't just have to be basic science research at the bench. It could be a lot of different types of things. It could be clinical research. It could be talking to people and getting information out there. Dr. Goodell, do you have any thoughts about research or how you view it on an application as well? Yeah. So um, I, it research is great because it does a bunch of good things or it can do a bunch of good things for your application, even if you decide you don't want to do it for your career. Um, and I too have talked to people where, where the thing that they learned from their research project was like, uh, so I always thought that science was sort of, you know, certain and that's why I liked it. And it turns out, no, you can plan everything perfectly and it still doesn't work. Um, yeah, so research, one of the great things that research uh, tells us is something about your intellectual curiosity. So that's why I say like loads of different types of research are, are possible and will give us that message and allow you to kind of develop one of your interests. So you don't have to be interested in, you know, neurobiology or biochemistry and you don't, that's fine. But maybe, maybe your research is more in the realm of public health you know, and so you get involved in some research projects that are like, oh, we are actually going to look at the impact of this new food program uh, that was located in this community health center to see if it actually improved people's diabetes, uh, whatever outcomes. Like, that would be an amazing research project. And it's not the type of bench research that I think people think of if they're like, I don't like it, I don't want to do it. Um, by the same token, I have talked with some people who are, um, have, described fascinating projects. One person who um, did an independent research project for credit at, 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 during her, it was like a senior thesis that was all about the use of narrative in addiction recovery um, throughout history. It was fascinating and she knew everything about it. We had such a good conversation. So, and, and you know, um, she talked about how that impacted her and was she planning to be an addiction researcher? No, not necessarily. But what I got from that is like, here is somebody who is really curious, who wants to go find out more, who can work independently. You know what I mean? All these other things. So 
I, I also encourage people to do research, but just expand your definition of research and know that like, we're sort of taking from that research, whatever it is you give it. Like, we don't want you to do research because we're trying to see how likely you are to become a Nobel prize winner. Like, that's not the thing. We're just trying to see other things like, are again, are you curious? Are you persistent? Can you work in a team? Can you, you know, it's, it's more like that. Yeah, so speaking of teamwork too, is, is there's that aspect of working well on a team and also not only being a member of the team, but maybe helping to push a team forward and being a leader in some capacity. So Mr. Taylor, I wanna direct this type of question to you because it's a theme that I've been seeing too, because we hear that leadership is important, but what does leadership really mean in the context of a pre-medical applicant? And also how can they, how can students who may have some form of leadership really convey what they've done as a leader? You know, we, we we really like to see leadership. We think that that's very important. And, and I think Dr. Goodell uh, spoke to that just a moment ago when she was speaking about uh, participating in research. And for us, the real value of research is, is the applicant knowing that research is happening and actually knowing how to apply what's coming out of the research. Um, medicine moves on research. And they've got to really know how to use it. And however they find out how to use it, it is up to them. Leadership, on the other hand, every team's got to have leaders. But a good leader's got to know when to lead and when to follow, when to let somebody else uh, lead. Also, we, we run into um, students all the time who uh, get out and try to do their first real intubation, and they have to move out. <laughs> out of the way in just a minute to let a respiratory therapist come in and say, let me do this before you hurt this guy. Uh, you, but you've got to learn and you've got to know, uh, there's got to, every team's got to have leadership uh, to be successful. So we like to see that this demonstrated and there's a bazillion ways it can be demonstrated uh, in, in the military, in sports, in the community, in their school, uh, organizational things. Uh, just a lot of ways that, that this can be uh, demonstrated and you don't have to be uh, a really high process lead, uh, leader but you've got to know the difference and, and how to be out front when it's your turn to be out front absolutely and so dr robinette on that topic of leadership what are what are some of the ways that you've seen students convey their leadership experiences or demonstrate that they have leadership experience and kind of make it clear what they did as leaders whether or not it was a formal position or not yeah, I think that um, yeah, I've had questions about whether or not you should bullet point your AMCAS responses. And the answer is like, that's what we read. Just tell us what you did as a leader. Tell us what your experience is. You can tell us how you messed up and pulled it together in the end. Like all of that yeah. adds texture and authenticity to your application. Um, I've seen more and more like I founded this club. You do not need to found a club or, or, or be the founder of a club that's found as not, not the verb I was going for, but you do not need to be the founder of a club in order to demonstrate leadership. We just want to see that you're participating in your campus community or outside of that. It can be with paid employment. So if you were chosen, if you work in a fast food restaurant, you're chosen to be a shift leader or to be someone who trains new people on the um, register, like that's great. Just talk to us about kind of what you've done, what it felt like to be a teacher, a leader, things that went well, things that didn't. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that answer. And um, Dr. Goodell, I, I want to ask you a question too, because I saw it a few times in the chat and it's about sort of creating a list of medical schools to apply to. I know, you know, there are some medical schools that uh, may value more people in the local vicinity, that, that kind of community. So when you're, you know, talking to a pre-med student who may be applying just and, and, and just start getting started and being interested in you know, applying broadly and wanting to really become a doctor, how would you advise them to create a list of medical schools to apply to? Would you say that they should be, you know, only apply to schools in their area, apply broadly? How would you go about making a list? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> first of all, the where the uh, variety of experiences one can have for undergraduate education is massive, right? Big school, tiny school, urban school, rural school, like specific engineering school versus like liberal arts, whatever, huge variety. In medical schools, the variety is like this, okay? If we're talking about allopathic medical schools, there are I think 156 of them and they're very close in size. So this should be reassuring to you. And this is like a preface of what I'm gonna say because 
any medical school in the United States that you get into is going to get you to your goal, which should be be a doctor. And, and while there are some differences, they're just not that big. So, okay, that being said, you still have to figure out like, all right, that's great, but what, how am I gonna decide out of these 156, how am I gonna decide which you know, 25 to apply to? So um, one important point is to figure out who you are and what you are excited about, what you are passionate about, and then find the schools that fit you. And also when you're finding the schools, as opposed to trying to make yourself the perfect applicant that can optimize your chances of getting into every medical school, like just don't, just figure out what, who you are and what you need and what you're excited about and find the schools that fit you. Now, part of it is what you're excited about. Also part of it is like other things like your, you know, your academic metrics, right? And also geography. Maybe you're like, I don't, I, I need to be kind of near my family. I don't think I can move, blah, blah, blah. So when those are all considerations to think about when building your school list, um, when it comes to things like, so, and I, one thing that I would point you in the direction of is the MSAR, which is the medical school admissions requirements. That's the publication by the AAMC. Like they get the data from the medical schools and it includes things like what's the average MCAT score and the range. What is the average GPA and the range? What are the, I mean, what are the deadlines? It tells you where it is. It tells you if it has certain programs. And happily, there is this new section that's an expanded mission section where some schools um, have, I'm excited, including ours, have taken the opportunity to really tell you like, look, this is what we're all about. Now, not all medical schools have an obvious niche, but when there is one, you should think about whether that's a good fit for you. If you're like, Oh, all right, you know, say, say you're practically a genius with your like 4.0 and your MCAT of 525 and you basically could do whatever you want. And you're like, I don't know, I feel like I should go to Wash U in St. Louis or Hopkins or something, but like, I don't know, I'm really more of a primary care gal than like, please, please go to a primary care school. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like do the thing that is good for you, not just whatever. So pay attention to things like metrics and what's possible, yes, but then also look at the schools that are the best fit for you in other ways as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and I want to piggyback off that a little bit to Mr. Taylor, because, you know, you mentioned things like having, you know, obviously having a good GPA and a good MCAT score is helpful, but some students may have had experiences where early on in college, they may not have had the highest GPA. And, you know, they're working on additional things to help boost that up over the years. Mr. Taylor, do you look at trajectory? Do you look at the experiences someone's had after maybe some bad grades early on in an experience? And how can somebody overcome, you know, a lower GPA at some point or, you know, somebody who's applying with that being their weakness? The way you overcome a lower GPA on the front end is to show a higher GPA on the back end. Uh, difficult and demanding course loads. I mean, schools know the difference between, and, and every school out there has these, less difficult courses uh, where you can probably ace them uh, very easily. Um, you, you've got to show, you know, you've got to show that you can function under a load. Uh, our first semester has pretty much twice what anybody will take as an undergraduate load uh, in a semester. So you've got to be able to show us that you can overcome that. But I tell you, another great value in, in doing that, getting it together, it shows a person that matures. It show it gives demonstration of something you're really looking for, and sometimes you're just having to guess whether it's there or not. But when you see somebody that's really pulled it together and overcome um, a difficult slow start, uh, that that's an important thing to see. It also demonstrates a person who can change, uh, and change is is such a critical thing because. When you, you know, what gets you to the front door of medical school will not get you through, will not get you through. You have to change and adjust. It's a different world and you've got to be ready to change in the world. And you know what we tell our students, you know, on the first day of medical school up until today, 90% of you are used to being in the top 10% of your class. As of today, 90% of you are not in the top 10% of your class. And the look that goes across the room when you, when you tell people that, that's reality. That's exactly the way it is. So they've got to be able to change and adjust and, and adapt to the ever-changing situation, which is medical school and medicine. And that resilience, right? That ability right. to 
change and be resilient is so important. And Dr. Goodell, then one way that students can show that resilience and that ability to adapt and change is through the personal statement. Mm -hmm. So when you're reviewing a personal statement, you know, how would you advise somebody to write in such a way that really conveys why they want to become a physician, what challenges they've overcome, and what really stands out when you're reviewing somebody's personal statement then? Um, so I think the most important thing in the personal statement is to be clear and sincere. And it does not need to be unique, frankly. Like, I read more than a th personally read more than a thousand applications every cycle. So it is really hard to make a personal statement that I remember. And if I remember it, it probably has more to do with very unusual circumstances that you have no control over. <laughs> like, I'll just remember like, wow, that's really dramatic. But it's like, wasn't really something that you did necessarily. So, so don't worry about standing out or having a unique uh, reason for going to medical school or having like a life-changing experience. Or suddenly I realized I had to be a doctor. Like, not the case for most people. What we really want to know is why are you going to medical school and why do you think you'll be great at it? And just tell us that as clearly as you possibly can. Um, that actually is what stands out. I often find myself when I'm writing my notes on the application, I often find myself writing, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll note the fact that uh, seems motivation seems very sincere. And I don't know how else to put it. It's just that like the combination of the words they use to describe why they want to do this backed up by their personal experiences um, all kind of hangs together and makes sense. And I find myself looking at the whole application and being like, yeah, I totally get it. it makes perfect sense to me, you know? Um, and I, the other thing I would say about the personal statement is of course you should have somebody proofread it for you, but, but actually, and, and it should be written kind of funny, like formal, but not too sanitized, if that makes sense. So when I'm really trying to understand why somebody is going to medical school, I usually just ask them, I had an entire day of advising yesterday. And the first thing I did when people sat down is it said like, so, so, so first of all, just tell me like, why is it that you want to go to medical school? And literally all of these people were then showing me their personal statements. And I was like, okay, so you know, the thing you said about your dad and his physical therapy practice and how it felt so like homey and like family there. And he was so, he cared about the whole person. I was like, that story should go in there. <laughs> that sounds like a big motivator to you. And it's fine to just go ahead and tell us like, my dad is a role model for the kind of caretaker that I want to be someday or whatever, you know? So anyway, just being clear and not worrying that you need to like add in some impressive, like grand generalizations about the state of medicine. Cause you think that's what like just clear and sincere. That makes a lot of sense. And, and you make a great point about the dots connecting because people have a lot of different experiences. And when looking back and, and kind of prepping an application, it's it, it's helpful to make those dots connect in some way that really conveys a story or an idea of, okay, how did this person decide that they want to become a physician? And then how did they get to this point today to where they're applying? And I think connecting those dots is a very, very helpful thing. Um, but in that process, I'm going to ask you, Dr. Robinette, some people may make some mistakes. Some people may kind of have some hiccups along the way or, or not put together their application maybe in a way that truly conveys who they are. So what are some of the mistakes, the big mistakes, the kind of glaring errors that people make and how would you address them? How would you tell, you know, the group of, of over 700 people watching right now, you know, what they should avoid doing or some of the things that you've seen people do that kind of maybe hurt their chances a little bit. Yeah, so the one most notable thing for us that does, it's like a lead balloon in our committee when people write this incredibly graphic um, description of a severe trauma or the smell of the burning skin in the OR, we're like, oh, like, what are you doing? Like, you do not need to prove to us that you're not gonna pass out during third year. So, you know, I think that sometimes creative writing, like do not, I said this, Dr. Goodell said this, you are not getting any grades or creative writing. We just literally want to hear why you want yeah. to be a doctor. So we've had applications, usually the ones I remember are terrible. Like we had someone who applied <laughs> decades ago. This is when I was a medical student, but I still remember it's like single white female in search of a medical school. And it was written like a wanted ad in the penny saver, which probably none of you know what that means, but you know, just like not super creative, 
out of the box is not good. We just want to hear why you want to be a doctor. Like that is what we want to hear. The other thing I will say is when you talk about shadowing, hero worshiping doctors, like, oh, the doctor saved everyone. It was all perfect. You can come across as a little bit of credulous or naive. Like what we want to hear about is that patient physician relationship, why you see yourself in that doctor's shoes one day with a, you can't know what it's like to be a doctor until you actually are one, but just like with a little bit of of humility, like doctors aren't saving the world. Like even if you saw one ER doctor pull someone through a code, like recognizing that as a physician, you're not going to go and code a hundred people and save them all. So just kind of having a little bit of um, true insight into the medical profession rather than, than um, platitudes. I, I would say like someone asked about, and I know this is stepping on the personal statement answer, but just like tell a story, like that you were moved by. I saw this patient who was newly diagnosed with breast cancer and the way the physician handled it. And it was really difficult. Um, and hopefully in the future, I'd like to do this type of thing. Like just tell a story of something that you witnessed. Um, yeah, I think that answers it. The other, so those, that would probably be the biggest mistake. And the other thing is just like the, ch the box checkers, I know Mr. Taylor mentioned often, it's just like, I did this and I did that and I did the other. It's like, I don't care. I can see that. What I want to know is like, what did you learn from that? Like, it's great that you did that, but what did you learn from it? Like, what about that experience overseas or in a local shelter for people who are experiencing homelessness? Like, what about that experience made you want to be a doctor? Yeah. yeah and I want to, I want to add, uh, go for it, please. Absolutely. Just, just, just a couple of brief thoughts on that. Um, make sure you're adding information there that's not found elsewhere in the application. I know at least at my school, there's a very good probability that my committee members are going to read your experiences before they read your uh, personal statement. So don't repeat yourself there. And when it comes down to writing your personal statement, write what you've got to say, be succinct, send the extra information you want them to have, and then stop writing. You don't have to fill up that whole space. You run a real risk in doing that if you just fill up the whole space because there's a possibility there's something really important at the end. And by the, time, by the time any of us or any of our committee members have read a couple of thousand applications, uh, chance of you reading every word in that thing is not very good. And you might miss something uh, if there's something very important that comes at the end. So write what you've got to say and stop. Yeah, no, that's a great point. But then on that same topic of of making sure that people are kind of doing things that make sense, what are some of the mistakes you've seen people make? Or, you know, what are some uh, some of the red flags that have really kind of hurt applicants in the past? Because, you know, you mentioned you've been doing this for decades and decades. So what are some of those serious mistakes that people should avoid making? Oh, I, I think I think my colleagues here have gone over most of those uh, over and over. Just, you know, don't bore the reader. Uh, give them something that excites them, make them want to know more about you. Uh, we, we had an applicant once who was telling us about their uh, altruism, about how many times they had stopped and saved turtles out of the middle of the road. Uh, okay, that's a little, that's a little different, but uh, coming from where we come from, maybe it's not so different. But in, in any case, uh, the things in there, most people, you, you see the same things. I, how many times have y'all seen Tick, tick, tick. The clock on the emergency room wall. Tell us what's different about you. Where where did you get your motivation? What's fanned your flames? What brought you uh, to this point in your life? And that that's what you put in there. And it's a mistake to do otherwise. And it's a mistake to say the same thing over and over and over through throughout. But a lot of us are conditioned to do that. You got to fill up the whole space. Please don't. Definitely, definitely. Um, Dr. Goodell, I want to ask you a question that I saw a few times in the chat as well. I want to make sure we get to it. And it's it's on the topic of letters of recommendation. So obviously students need to ask for letters of recommendation and submit them. Any sort of criteria that you look for or, or would recommend for students to ask for letters of recommendation? Does it have to be science professors? Does it have to be certain teachers? Does it have to be from experiences? How would you how would you sort of guide someone who's saying, hey, I don't have any letters of recommendation. I want to apply in the next year or two. How should I go about collecting those letters of, of recommendation and who should I be asking? Yeah, so um, different medical schools have different rules about this. So there are, so some medical schools have a rule that like they need to see two letters from a science professor or something like that. We actually got rid of those requirements because 
um, we found that so often they weren't helpful, you know, and it actually really came up during COVID. We had all these people that were taking, you know, biology and chemistry um, remotely, and they hadn't had a chance to get to know professors very well. And it was, it was just ended up being sort of useless. So for us, the most important thing, and the reason we got rid of that requirement is because we really want letters from people that know you. And the best bet is to get people that know you, that, to get your different letter writers to be from different settings. So we like to have somebody that can speak to your academic work in a classroom or lab setting. So like, sure, it could be a science professor, but better off if you've got advanced, a, a smaller, uh, more high level course with a lab where the person could really talk about, you know, what, what stood out about you in the classroom. Um, another, it would, it's also great to get letters from people that know you in a different setting, like a work setting. Um, people might not think about it, but like sports coaches, uh, musical people have coached you in a musical instrument and, um, you know, people who have seen you work in a team, any kind of a team, all of the volunteer experiences, all of those things are great. They're going to tell us different things about you. And what we want is for those letters to really add to the information that we have in the application. Right. So like it's one thing for us to say, wow, this person's done a lot of service activities. They must really care about people. And it's another thing for uh, to get a letter. And this is one I got this year, a letter from um, a person who had supervised an applicant at his paid job where he worked in a group home for people with um, I think it was autism. And this supervisor, who is not a physician, was just the guy running the home, said this young man is our best staff member. And here's why. It's because he was somehow able to connect with um, people that nobody else had been able to connect with. And it's because he uh, handled lots of very difficult situations with people throwing things at him or people being very upset. And he managed to maintain like calm and respect towards everyone, even those, and um, talked about how he went out of his way to like celebrate people's birthdays showed up with a cake one time for somebody who was a like a less well-liked resident of this group home and he was afraid that something bad would happen on his birthday and so so even though he wasn't working that day he showed up with a cake and I was like that's beautiful like this is a great person so so somebody that knows you and can speak to some special things about you I think it was Doug that was talking about um, sports before I can remember a couple of letters I've had from coaches that said frankly like yeah this was not this person was not the best player on the team but she sat there and supported everybody sat there on the bench and supported everybody for 3 years and that's why she got to be captain in the fourth year you know what i mean it was just like like those are those are great so yeah letters from people who know you in different settings i love it and so i wish that we could do the session for hours and hours and hours because there's so much valuable information here and we could see it by all those questions that are popping up in the q and a but obviously we can't get through everything. And so we have just a few minutes left. So in one minute or less, I'm gonna ask each one of you for your biggest piece of advice, the, the thing that you want to make sure everyone takes away from this panel, because you know honestly, this is, this is the one chance that people have to really hear directly from the people who are reviewing applications. So I'm gonna start with you, Mr. Taylor, in one minute or less, what's your biggest piece of advice to pre-meds? Quoting an old fellow that used to walk around this area here by the name of David Crockett, who said, make sure you're right, then go ahead. Make sure this is what you want to do as you're pursuing your schools, as you want to pick the schools you want to go to, go visit the schools. Put your feet on the ground, get a feeling for the school, the students, the, the community, everything about it. And that's how you'll pick uh, where you think you'll go to school. That's my biggest piece of advice. I love it. I love it. Thanks so much. Dr. Robinette, your, your answer. I can say I don't have a quote. Um, a, just apply, like many people are hung up on the gap years at just looking at this, like A, make sure you want to be a doctor. There are so many warm fuzzies. Oops. I talk with my hands. Make sure you want to be a doctor. There's so many warm fuzzies growing up when you say, oh, I want to be a doctor. And I grew up, everyone's excited. I think Mr. Taylor mentioned grandma can't, motivation can't get you along. Just make sure it's really what you want to do with your right. life. Um, and then apply early with your best application. We don't care at all about gap years. Like they're great. Or if you're ready straight through, that's terrific too. But make sure you have taken time to really discern that you want to be a physician, get the experience, community service, research, whatever it is you want to kind of best um, put yourself 
the best self forward and then apply to medical school. Perfect. Thanks so much. And Dr. Goodell, your answer. Um, mine is, you know, it's like a little bit um, similar to my colleagues, but I guess I would say like, do what you love. That should actually be do what you love and what is right for you. So like what you do should you have all the votes in deciding what you should do, right? Mom and dad love you a lot, but they don't get to decide what you do for your whole entire future. Uh, they're paying your tuition maybe right now. So like maybe let them do that. But you know, generally you have all of the votes. So that is true at the, about the timing of when you apply to medical school. That's true about the, the different activities that you choose. When you're doing that, choose the things that you are the most excited about um, as opposed to like what you think somebody else told you you should do or what you think looks the best or whatever. Do the thing that you're excited about. You are going to be the best at it. If you're excited about something, you're going to put more of yourself into it. You're going to um, be more proud of it. When you talk about it, it'll be more sincere. You'll get more out of it. All of those make a much, much better position, honestly, than um, than anything else. And it's, it's sort of what uh, what Doug said before, like this is, it's, this is actually too hard to do if you don't really, really, really want to do it. So go ahead and do the things that you are psyched about. And if they line up with medicine, great, you know, and then, and then make your career around that. I love it. The three of you have been fantastic. You've answered so many questions directly to students. And, and this was so valuable to hear from the three of you. Thank you so much for taking the time out on your Saturday to answer questions for students and to really make a difference.